Today, I want to welcome you to the sixth week of this series of Compton Lectures. And this marks the, the end of the second third, which is really the culmination of what is considered standard model physics. That is, things that we're pretty sure we understand fairly well. Things that we've got a lot of experimental evidence for, sometimes indirectly, and that hold together very well. And of course, for those of you who may not be aware of this, the standard model is, and some of the predictions that it's made, have been the most accurate and the most detailed physical predictions we as a species has ever made about the physical world. And everything that we have predicted so far has come to pass about it. So it's really <coughs> a very beautiful, impressive structure that I hope you guys are starting to get a feel for. Uh, today's subject is symmetry and unification. You guys have been asking me for the last five weeks, you've been asking me questions about the Higgs particle, which I've been putting off. You've been asking me questions about tachyons, which I've been putting off. Some of you have been asking me questions about the weak force and electromagnetic and weak unification. Hopefully, you guys will all leave today more satisfied. <coughs> uh, just to get everybody in the mood, uh, I'm going to put up a summary from last week. Last week's subject was quarks and the strong force. And you'll recall that we started by, I started by just putting a huge slew of new particles on the board, which are combinations of three quarks or two, a quark and an anti-quark state that were discovered in the mid uh, in the mid years of last century. And we discovered that, just as the people who were working with them then discovered, that these particles can be made sense of by putting them into patterns, organizing them by their spin and by their mass, by their charge. Um, we discovered that baryons were made of three quarks and mesons were made of a quark and an antiquark, and those are the two basic kinds of particles we had. Of course, the, the most basic form of baryon is the proton. That's the particle that most of us are very 
With that note, I will put on the board today's title, which is Symmetry and Unification. And I will start with something that doesn't obviously have anything to do with either symmetry or unification. The weak force. There are some interactions, and several of which I have already mentioned, that can't be explained by either the strong force or the electromagnetic force. First of all, some particle decays involve a change in quark flavor. Remember last week we talked about quarks coming, the quarks in the Eightfold Way coming in three varieties, up, down, and strange. Those make up most of the, the low-lying mesons and baryons. And we talked about the fact that, for example, neutrons, which are a down, down, and an up quark, can decay into protons which are an up, an up, and a down quark. Well, that implies that at some point a down quark turned into an up quark. But I never explained how that happened. And the reason I didn't is because I was talking about the strong force. And the strong force can't change the flavor of a quark. And neither can the electromagnetic force. So that's something that we can't explain without the weak force. The second thing is the fact that neutrinos interact with matter. Now, they don't interact very strongly, but if they didn't interact at all, we never would have discovered them. And neutrinos, they, they're not charged, they're not electromagnetically charged, and they're not colored. So, based on just having electromagnetic and strong forces, it doesn't make any sense that neutrinos ever interact with anything. There must be something that allows them to interact. The third point I want to make is that effects that are associated either with a flavor change in quark or with neutrino interactions tend to be much, much weaker. The interactions are less likely. Particles that have to decay this way tend to have much longer lifetimes. And in general, that's why it's called the weak force. It's a much weaker effect than either the strong or the electromagnetic. Now, the weak force turns out to be mediated by three particles, the W plus, the W minus, and the Z naught bosons. They're spin one particles. And what I put on board here is an example of a weak decay, is neutron decay. 
mediators are massive. They're the only fundamental force mediators that are massive. This make the gluons and the photons are massless particles, and this may, again makes them very different. In fact, they're very, very massive. They are at least 50 times as massive as any of the particles we met last week. They're really, really heavy. Hopefully, by the end of the day, you'll get a feel for what makes this true. We want to explain two things. Why are the weak force mediators massive? And what is their connection to the electromagnetic force? Why should they be charged under the electromagnetic force? In order to get there, I'm going to take you back to week two, which was quantum mechanics. We talked about the idea of particles being bumps in a field. Well, the first example we have of this is photons, which we know are disturbances in the electromagnetic field. We know the disturbances in the electromagnetic field are light. That's Maxwell, mid-19th century. And we know that photons are sort of discrete amounts of this disturbance. So that makes them basically bumps in the electromagnetic field. We also know from, I believe, two weeks ago that electrons and positrons are disturbances in the Dirac sea. It turns out that that's another kind of field. It's sort of like the electromagnetic field. It's just for a different particle. Any particle can be thought of as a disturbance in some underlying field. And in order to understand the role that the Higgs particle plays in the standard model, it's oftentimes more useful to think of it as a field than as a particle. A good analogy to think of when you're, when you're doing this is think of the field as a rubber sheet that's stretched taut. And you can perturb it a little bit, and if you create a little disturbance, then that, just, that ripple can travel along the rubber sheet. And it can, you know, it can disperse and it can interact. And because of the elasticity of the, of the sheet, there's energy associated with such a disturbance. It doesn't, its natural resting place is completely flat. But if you give it a little bit of energy, 
surgery you perturb it, the more and more negative the energy gets. This, is, turns out, does not make a lot of physical sense for us. Because it's as if you've taken the rubber sheet and you've moved it infinitely, the whole thing infinitely far away from where it wants to rest, and you have it up at some super high, you know, weird, disturbed state, and it just wants to go back down. That, turns out, doesn't make a whole lot of sense for us. On the other hand, there are other shapes that you could imagine for the potential energy. And suppose that for the zero, it looks unstable. If I have it here, it looks unstable. A small disturbance decreases the energy. But if I get it far enough away, it turns out, for example, at some positive value in the field up here, it is actually at a minimum, or at some negative value down here. This actually does make sense. And what it really means is that what we thought we meant by the vacuum, where there's no value for the field, where there's no particles, doesn't make sense as a vacuum. It's this weird, unstable configuration. And what really is the physical vacuum is down here at one of the minima. The physical universe really wants to sit here at some, or here, at some non-zero value for the field. And in this way, you can sometimes have a tachyonic particle and have it still make sense. This is the only way you can. Only if there is some valid minimum value where the physical universe can actually sit. And you'll notice that if the, if the physical universe, if the, if the sheet settles in here, now a small perturbation, a small bump around this value is associated with an increase in energy, right? And so if you start here and you call this the vacuum, then a small bump off this has a normal positive max. <coughs> now, I'm going to take you away from that, and I'm going to introduce the third seemingly unrelated topic. <coughs> What's a symmetry? <coughs> 
can't tell the difference between Chicago and some point in the center of the sun or out in the middle of the vacuum of space. And this is, to a certain degree, if you think about it, you can ask, how did that happen? How could it be that the physical laws of nature treat all points in space the same, and yet somehow be wound up in this universe where not all points are created equal? Well, far in the past, the universe, you can, you can picture the universe as just some uniform amount of matter that's evenly distributed. But there are little, because of you know, virtual particle, antiparticle pairs, there are little quantum disturbances in this uniform background. And eventually what happens is some region of space gets enough temporary mass increase in it that it starts gravitational collapse. Because mass tends to attract other mass, it starts to coalesce. And suddenly you get areas, regions of the universe that have more matter than other regions. And this collapse continues. And eventually you wind up with galaxies, and then solar systems, and then planets. And at this point, what we say is that the symmetry that you started with, which was that every point in, the spa every point in space looks the same, has been spontaneously broken. It could have been that, you know, several light years that way became the Earth. But it didn't. It was some, there's a randomness associated with it that this point in space coalesced into a huge amount of matter and not that one over there. Example number two, and this one is a little bit more apropos. Suppose you start with a marble on a track, and not coincidentally, this track is the same shape as that potential energy that I was working with earlier. The track itself is symmetric for reflections about this central axis. But if you have a marble that's allowed to run on this roller coaster track, then eventually the marble will come to rest. And when it comes to rest, it will either wind up here or here. But once it does, it has broken the symmetry. The system is no longer symmetric about this central axis. Now, for small motions, small amounts of energy about this minimum, the symmetry remains broken. It's now not the same on either side of this central line. On the other hand, if you give the marble enough energy, the energy in the marble will wind up restoring the symmetry. Now, again, over averaged over time, this looks the same on either side of the central line. And that brings us to the actual subject of today's lecture. And I'm going to put, hopefully I'm going to put together all three of the things we've been talking about. The symmetry, the fields and potential energy, and the weak force all at once. This is called the Higgs mechanism, and I'm giving you a simplified model of it. I am not pretending to give you all of the physical details here. There is a proposed particle called the Higgs, whose potential energy associated with the Higgs field has this double well shape to it, which is to say about some zero value, it's tachyonic. But then there are these stable points that the physical vacuum can settle into. The shape of this potential energy has a symmetry to it that seems to treat positive values for the Higgs field exactly the same as negative values. It's symmetric about that central line. But the physical universe can't really, we can't really make sense of the physical universe perturbed about that central point because that central point is unstable. If the, if the vacuum was there, then a tiny little perturbation in the Higgs field would want to send it completely off 
in a new direction because a small perturbation decreases the energy. Instead, it settles into one of the minima. The physical universe, what we call the vacuum, is actually a constant value for the Higgs field that corresponds to one of these two minimum values for the energy. There's a symmetry that's broken at this point, and it turns out that what we observe as this symmetry being broken is a symmetry between the electromagnetic and the weak forces. Before the symmetry is broken, you have one force with four mediators, all of which behave exactly the same. And you can think of the four mediators, the photon, the W plus, the W minus, and the Z, as similar to the eight gluons for the strong force. The eight gluons are all basically the same, and they're all colored, and they all you know, interact with each other. Before the symmetry is broken, the four mediators of the electromagnetic and the weak forces all interact with each other, and they're all the same. It's just four mediators for one force. But once the symmetry is broken, you wind up with three mediators of one force looking very different from a fourth mediator of a, of a second force. And what you get as a residual effect of the fact that underneath this there was really originally one force is that the, is that the weak mediators wind up still directly interacting with the photon. So that remains, but the two forces now look physically different. Now one of the most obvious differences between the weak force and the electromagnetic force is the mass differences in the mediators. The photon's massless, the weak particles are, ma are massive. So what's the deal? Well, we talked about very high energies restoring asymmetry. Now, in the, in the field picture, Again, we have the rubber sheet, and we have it settle into, say, this is one of the physical minima down here. Small perturbations about this, the symmetry is broken. That's low energy configurations. One particle here, one particle there. They move around, but everything's very close to empty space. Well, if you get a really, really high, large amount of energy in a small amount of space, now we're talking about huge waves in the field, right? This rubber sheet is really going crazy. Well, if the other minimum, the one that the physical universe isn't in, is up here, but the waves are like this, now it looks as though the symmetry has been restored by considering enough, putting in, by putting enough energy into the system you've restored the symmetry. And another way to see this is that if you put enough energy into a system, you've got so much kinetic energy that the mass energy associated with the W and the Z bosons is really small in comparison. You talk about, part you give a particle enough energy and you can pretty much ignore its mass energy because it's got so much more kinetic energy than it does mass energy. And when, this, when, when space has that much energy in it, there's really not that much difference between a photon and a Z naught. Now, sometimes it helps to sort of put this in a historical picture and have sort of a timeline in your head for how this actually happened. Well, using the Big Bang model for the evolution of the universe, over the course of the history of the universe, the universe has been expanding. And as it has expanded, it has cooled. There's, there's an energy conservation associated even with the Big Bang. And because the volume is getting larger, the amount of energy in any given amount of space is getting smaller over time. So the universe cools as it gets bigger. Well, this means if you go back far enough in time, and this is a history of the Big Bang, which I think is probably too small. Sorry about that, guys. But if you go back to, you know, roughly 
10 to the negative 12 seconds after the Big Bang, which is really a very small amount of time. Then the universe is small and very, very hot, and the ambient energy for particles and fields is so high that the electromagnetic force and the weak force are combined in one. And then, you know, you can think of the Higgs field as being hugely bumpy. There's just perturbations all over it. It's moving everywhere. And then, as the universe expands and cools, it's going to settle down. And it, you know, it's like you're stretching the rubber sheet. And it settles either down here or here. It doesn't really matter which one, but, it's, but it chooses one. And after that amount of time, the universe is expanding, the bumps are getting smaller, and now we really say the vacuum is here, and you've got a little bump here, which is a particle, and maybe you have a little bump here, which is a particle, but it's really basically empty space. Many of you think of the Higgs as the particle which generates masses. And obviously, I've already alluded to this a little bit because the weak mediators have mass and the photon doesn't. And you can ask, well, how did they get that mass to begin with? And it turns out it's worse than that. In fact, you also need some way to give quarks masses. So imagine you have some other kind of particle. You, let's, let's simplify everything. We just have the Higgs particle, and then you have one other thing. And that's the whole universe. And this one other thing is a massless particle. Doesn't matter what it is, but whatever it is, it interacts with the Higgs particle. Now, the Higgs field in the physical vacuum has some constant value. Here's phi equals zero. Here's the Higgs field is, is zero everywhere. But the physical vacuum is down here. And that's at some constant value for the Higgs field. It's like, you know, the electromagnetic field, can, there can be small disturbances in it, which are photons. But you can also just have a big constant electric field somewhere, right? You turn on a big, you know, capacitor. And in between the two plates of the capacitor, you have an electric field. Well, just like that, the physical vacuum has some, everywhere, has some constant value for the Higgs field. Well, what does this mean for a particle that interacts with the Higgs field? As it travels around through what we're now calling the vacuum, it is constantly interacting with this Higgs field. And there's an energy that's associated with this interaction. It's a, you know, it's an interaction energy, really. But we, from our perspective, thinking of that as the vacuum, observe this interaction energy as a mass. It's just this particle, it has some energy associated with just being in this space. Well, that looks like a mass to me. Even if it's just sitting there, it's still interacting with the Higgs field. It's a mass. It's, a, it's some internal energy associated with it just being there. And that is how quarks and weak mediators have, and the W and the Z bosons wind up with mass. A good analogy for this is photons traveling through some medium. We know that photons really only travel at, that light only really travels at the speed of light in vacuum. When we say the speed of light, what we really mean is the speed of light in vacuum. That's the, you know, that's the scale. That's the maximum value for speed anywhere in the universe. But when, it, when light is traveling through air or glass or water, it actually travels slightly slower than that. This is optics. This is what creates optics. And there's my photon, and it's traveling through air. Well, anything that's not traveling at the speed of light should have mass, right? So it looks as though somehow, effectively, the photon has obtained a mass. 
Now, in the case of photons and air, we can zoom in on this picture. If we take our microscope and we, you know, put a huge amount of power into it, what you actually see is little air molecules separated by empty space. And what's actually happening if you zoom in on the picture is the photon is traveling at the speed of light through the vacuum and then being absorbed by the air molecule. And then there's some tiny amount of delay and then it's re-emitted and then it zooms along at the speed of light until it hits the next air molecule. And it's really the delay between absorption and re-emission that creates in net what looks like light traveling slower than the speed of light. Well, this is fine for air molecules and light, but with the Higgs mechanism, you can't zoom in to the point where you can resolve it into little Higgs molecules <coughs> and empty space. No matter how far you zoom, you still just always wind up with this constant value for the Higgs field. It's like you completely smeared out these Higgs particle stuff, and it's everywhere. <coughs> so in this case, the analogy is actually exact. There's no point where you can zoom in and you can see, no, really, it's a particle traveling at speed of light, and then there's a delay. You can't get there. It's just a particle traveling slower than the speed of light. So it has mass. Now, the Higgs field influences the masses and the interactions of any particle in the universe that has an interaction with the Higgs. If it interacts with the Higgs field, because the Higgs field is everywhere non-zero, you can never neglect the Higgs, and it changes all of the values of everything around it. it changes all of the fields, it changes all of the strengths of interactions, it changes all of the masses, it changes everything. And because of that, all of these different physical quantities that you could write down, all of the masses of particles and the interaction strengths and decay times and, you know, probabilities of this scattering and, and you know, distributions of how particles will scatter, it's all related to the values associated with the Higgs field because the Higgs field influences everything. It's everywhere. And because of that, you can reverse engineer the system. And from looking at the masses of the particles around you and the interaction strengths and measuring all of these things, you can wind up with predictions for what the Higgs particle will look like and how strongly it'll interact with everything around it. And when you go to the LHC, what you're actually measuring as the Higgs particle is little bumps in the constant value of the Higgs field, which, are, which have some positive mass. But you can predict what this mass will be. And here we have what is the best predictions we have. You can see as you go up in value for the Higgs mass in GeV per C squared, if it's too low, then it's excluded by a certain set of experimental values. If it's too high, then it's excluded by a certain other set of experimental values. And then there are direct searches where we've, gone, we've actually gone and looked for the Higgs directly. And if we didn't find it in some particular region, we know it's not there. And that most recent, uh, the most recent restriction in this way comes from the Fermilab Tevatron experiments. And they excluded this region here. And what you wind up with is a fairly constrained region where we know the Higgs, if we understand anything, the Higgs should be some, somewhere between 114 GeV and 185 GeV. But we also know it's not really between 160 and 170 because we've looked there. And what the LHC is going to do is look in the rest of this region. And if we understand the standard model at all, if, we, if we've correctly interpreted how the Higgs particle gives the other particles masses and how it influences 
how the, the weak and the electromagnetic forces split into two forces, then we should find the Higgs somewhere in here. And we, we go and we run the LHC and we fail to find the Higgs, then there's something really wrong with our picture of the universe. The Higgs particle belongs in the standard model. Most people define the standard model as what we already know, what we've measured. But strictly speaking, the Higgs particle is the last particle of the standard model. Without it's the linchpin. Without it, the whole thing falls apart because we don't understand why the weak mediator should have mass. We don't understand why the quarks should have mass. We don't understand why the weak mediator, mediator should interact directly with photons. And all of these things together sort of make a disaster out of the standard model if the Higgs isn't there. Yes? Uh, why is the standard model so successful in predicting things? Uh, why is it successful? Hopefully because it's thing. right. <laughs> that 
for in either one field or in the other, and you get a decrease in energy until you wind up with some circle of values. The you know the, the amount of one field squared plus the amount of another field squared is some constant gives you a minimum value for the energy. And then, so the physical universe, after, after the universe has expanded and the, the, the wiggles and the fields have settled down, settles somewhere along this bottom valley. So say the physical universe sits right there. Well, you can see that there are two fields associated with this, and you can ask, there are two different kinds of perturbations. But here, it makes sense to say, what about, you, you can perturb it this way, along which you're kind of going up the sides of the valley. A small amount of extra field in this direction increases the energy, or in this direction increases the energy. Or you could imagine changing the value of the field locally along the bottom of the valley. And you can see that that doesn't actually increase the energy at all. It's flat. It doesn't seem to care where in the valley it sits. Well, th that small amount of perturbation, not changing the value of the energy, that's a massless particle. There's no energy associated with a small perturbation. Well, that energy is the mass of the particle. So if that energy isn't there, what you have is something massless. You started with two particles, both of which, you know, if you thought about the universe here, you started with two particles, both of which had tachyonic masses. And then when you let the universe settle into here, now you have one particle that has a mass, a normal mass, and another particle that's massless. Whenever you break a continuous symmetry, that's a symmetry the symmetry around the system, about the system is some rotation. And just like the circle, you can rotate it by any amount and it still comes back to itself. This is a continuous rotation. Whenever you spontaneously break a continuous rotation, there's a massless particle that has to be associated with this. Because there's always some sort of perturbation associated with traveling along the valley. That mass is the, the type of massless particle is called a Nambu Goldstone boson. It's named after Goldstone and our very own Michiro Nambu, who won the Nobel Prize for exactly this, and he won it last fall. And in the case of electroweak symmetry breaking in the Higgs, the particle that's massless, that has to be massless, that has to stay massless, is the photon. So you have four mediator particles, and three of them have to pick up masses because of this you know, constant interaction energy. But one of them has to stay massless because it's sort of associated with changes in the Higgs field that don't change the energy of the system. And now you've got, hopefully, the whole picture. Sure. 
And just because he was so much cooler than the rest of us, he wound up with light in the bargain. That's what every young physicist wants to do with their life. They want to take disparate physical phenomena and understand them all, put them all into one picture. Well, you can do that with the weak and the electromagnetic forces. What about the others? The, you know, the obvious place to look next is the strong force. Can we imagine that the strong force unifies with the electroweak force at some even higher energies? Maybe it's all part of one big, strong you know, force that's unified at really, really high energies. Well, is there any evidence for this? Some. One aspect of forces unifying is that the strengths of the forces must change as you change the energy. Now, we talked about this with the electric force. There are these uh, virtual positrons and electrons that pop into the vacuum, and they shield a charge that's in the vacuum, and they make the electromagnetic force look weaker and weaker at larger and larger energy distance scales. Well, long distance scales is short, is small energy. So as energy goes down, the electromagnetic force gets weaker. As energy goes up, as you get closer and closer, smaller and smaller distance scales, the electromagnetic force gets stronger. And we know that the strong force does exactly the opposite. The closer you get to a colored object, the weaker the strong force looks. The smaller the distance scale, the higher the energy scale, the strong force starts to decrease. Turns out that the weak force also decreases, doesn't decrease by as much. And if you can imagine that these three forces are really all one force at some very high energy, then they should all meet somewhere out here at some point. And at energies higher than this value, you wind up with some big, beautiful, unified theory. Well, if you take the standard model as given and you don't throw in anything extra and you just assume that that's the physical universe and you extrapolate from the physical experimental values, they don't quite meet. They just barely miss. Just barely. For a long time, people thought that they exactly met. But if you're really, really careful, you can see that they just don't quite. But there are certain other possible effects. Physicists are always imagining that there's something out there in addition to what we've already measured. And you can include certain other effects. And the favorite one is supersymmetry, which I'm not really going to talk too much about today. But there are certain extensions of the standard model. And if you throw them in, then you can make all three of these match. And the fact that they just barely don't, and you just make this little tweak to the standard model, and then it's all beautiful, is one of the big motivations that people have for imagining that supersymmetry really is there. It's because we would rather believe that they unify. It seems to make the universe simpler. And we like things that are simple. Now, whether you think that that's a good reason for believing something is really up to you, but it's there. So, to summarize, we started with the weak force, and we said, well, we need to add in the weak force to explain certain physical phenomena, such as neutron decays and neutrino interactions, that aren't explained by the strong or the electromagnetic forces. But the weak force really doesn't look the same as the strong or the electromagnetic forces because the weak force mediators are massive and because the weak force mediators are charged under the electromagnetic force and interact directly with the electromagnetic force. Then I talked about the fact, and I, I reminded you all, that particles are disturbances in fields. And we talked about the elasticity in the field being the potential energy associated with some small perturbation. And we talked about various forms for this potential energy that it 
electromagnetic and the weak forces tend to require the Higgs to be larger than 114. And really, the larger the better to get away from this. And then there's another set of indirect measurements that tend to want it to be smaller. And they would be happier as small as it can get. So there's a tension between them, really. There's not one perfect value. There's this pe these pieces of information really want it to be small, and these pieces of information really want it to be large. And what we get from that is that it should be somewhere in between. Yes? How come the tub track couldn't get at that lower flying section? It was designed to probe a particular energy. As a matter of fact, it wasn't designed to look for the Higgs at all. And that's part of why it doesn't look over the full range. The Tevatron was designed to look for standard model particles. It's an old accelerator. It was looking for the top quark and all of these other things. And you know, because it wasn't, particular, wasn't specifically designed to look in this range of energies, you know, they just sort of tweaked it a little so that they could say something valuable about the Higgs, and they wound up telling us about that. Yeah, go ahead. Is there a rumor that from tachyon applied to the particles that they were on stable energy, uh, you would fall in forever? Right.
a polynomial, if you go back to your math. And the number of minima or maxima is determined by, you know, the degree of the polynomial. Like a line has degree one, and it has no minima or maxima. And a quadratic thing has degree two, and it has one minimum or one maximum. A cubic thing is going to have one minimum and one maximum. A, qu a quadratic thing will have three extrema, and that's what we had there. We had two minima and one maxima, and so on. And it turns out that there are restrictions on, um, I don't want to dwell too much on this because it's a little esoteric to explain why, but it turns out that there are restrictions on the degree of, the, of, this, of this potential energy, that it doesn't make sense for it to have too high of a degree. So that puts one constraint. Then the other thing is that we know it doesn't make sense if it falls off to infinity. Because if it falls off to negative infinity, then that's an instability that you can't fix. There's no physical vacuum, because the physical vacuum is down there at negative infinity. That doesn't make any, any sense, so we know it can't have one of those. And when you put these things together, there's a, limit, there's a limited number of choices. It's either, you know, one, or it's got this, this double well shape, or maybe, you know, it's a very flat well, because it's like the quadratic thing where all three minima are the same place. But there really are very few limited options. And you can sort of write them down and ask what works. And it turns out that this double well shell shape is what works. Was that developed by Higgs or someone else? The story of the Higgs mechanism is complicated and to a certain degree controversial. I didn't name a lot of names today except Nambu's. And the reason is that there are a fair number of people in the field who will get very angry if you name the wrong set of names associated with this. And they disagree with each other about what the wrong set of names are. <laughs> part of the reason is that this whole story was developed originally not for particle physics, but for uh, superconductivity. And you know, the whole mathematical structure was developed for an entirely different, different physical system. And that was done partly by Nambu and partly by this guy named Phil Anderson. And several other people were associated with it. Um, and then, you know, it was transplanted from that world over to particles. And that was done partly by Higgs and partly by a couple of other guys. And then somebody else realized that this could be used to explain the electromagnetic and the weak forces. It was, you know, it's not like this was some guy out in the cabin who discovered it all himself. This is collaborative physics, and the story of the development is complicated. And it's, you know, it's not just one person. This is sort of the real world of physics. So when Higgs proposed it, he didn't have a specific function in mind? I almost don't want to say that Higgs proposed it. <laughs> because it's almost, it's kind of a fluke of history that we call it the Higgs particle. It could just as easily have been called the Nambu particle, or the Anderson particle, or, you know, any number of other possibilities. The Weinberg particle, the Glashow particle, there are huge numbers of people that were associated with this. He's, it's not like he presented anything, he presented one small part of the picture.
talking about some sort of symmetry and time translation? 
about each other's existence, and they are repulsed 